Since the beginning of the nuclear era, humanity has lived in fear of a catastrophe that would take millions of lives and render the planet uninhabitable. And these fears may not be unfounded. The nuclear bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the incident at the Mayak chemical combine, the accidents at Chernobyl and Fukushima, Japan. But not many people know that at one time Britain too had to face the threat of a nuclear explosion during the Windscale Fire, which resulted in the release of radioactive substances. This incident was long concealed by the authorities. You're on Visioner Channel and today I'm going to talk about it. You have to subscribe and like it, and I'll make it an interesting story. So, let's get started. After the end of World War II, the United States government passed a law prohibiting other countries from receiving the scientific fruits of the Manhattan Project. This meant that despite the participation of British scientists in the project, Britain received no benefits from the research. A year after the first successful nuclear bomb test by the United States in July 1945, the British government decided that they too needed to develop a nuclear program in order to maintain their position as a world power. This pilot project eventually evolved into the Windscale Nuclear Power Plant. In October 1957, after several years of successful operation, Windscale NPP workers noticed some curious temperature monitoring equipment readings while performing standard maintenance. The reactor temperature was slowly rising at a time when, according to their calculations, it should have been going down. The remote detection equipment seemed to be malfunctioning, so two plant workers donned protective gear and hiked to the reactor to inspect it in person. When they arrived, they were dismayed to find flames blazing inside the uranium-filled reactor. Windscale's two nuclear units had been built in concrete buildings near the small village of Siscale, Cambria, to produce weapons-grade plutonium. The fission reactors had a simple air-cooled configuration that allowed each to vent excess heat through a tall chimney. Reactors such as those at Windscale create plutonium by bombarding the most common isotope of uranium, uranium-238, with neutrons. Any uranium atoms that happen to absorb a neutron briefly become uranium-239, an unstable element that quickly decays to neptunium-239. With a half-life of only 2.355 days, this element also soon decays, producing the coveted plutonium-239. Each of Windscale's heavily shielded reactors consisted of a stack of massive graphite bricks. A series of vertical holes in these blocks served as channels for the reactor control rods, which were used to absorb free neutrons and thus regulate the fission rate. Hundreds of horizontal channels were cut into the octagon-shaped blocks to insert canisters filled with whatever substances the scientists wanted to bombard with neutrons. Many of these contained uranium for conversion to plutonium, but others were special isotope cartridges for producing radioisotopes. The canisters were inserted into place through the front of the reactor, called the loading surface, and after the neutrons had done their magic and converted most of the metallic uranium into plutonium, they were pushed out through the back into a water channel for cooling. The reactor itself was cooled by an air duct with a fan that forced air over the reactor core and out through 400-foot-high exhaust pipes. At the last minute, at the insistence of physicist Sir John Cockcroft, a filtration system was added to the top of each chimney, at great expense and effort. These filters became known as Cockcroft's folly because of their engineering complexity and questionable value. What was not realized during the construction of the plant was that graphite subjected to neutron bombardment tends to store energy in dislocations in its crystal structure. This stored energy is called Weiner energy, after the physicist Eugene Weiner, who discovered this effect in his own experiments. If left unchecked, graphite tends to spontaneously release the stored Weiner energy in a powerful burst of heat. This became evident after two years of operation, when there was an unexpected temperature rise in the core. In one case, this occurred when the reactor was shut down. To combat the accumulation of Weiner energy, the operators of the windscale reactor introduced a process in which the stored energy was removed by heating the graphite bricks to temperatures of 250 plus degrees Celsius, a process called annealing. At these temperatures, the crystalline structure of the graphite expands enough to allow the displaced molecules to fall into place and gradually release the stored energy, causing a uniform release that then spreads throughout the core. Such annealing cycles were performed every few months, and they were performed when the reactor was fully loaded with 35,000 canisters of uranium metal. For a time, the annealing was successful in preventing excessive Weiner energy buildup. But the reactors and associated apparatus were not designed with annealing in mind, so the monitoring equipment tended to provide unreliable feedback to reactor operators. 
cycles were also unpredictable, releasing stored energy at temperatures that varied from case to case. In 1957, windscale operators changed their procedures so that an annealing was required every 40,000 megawatt days rather than every 30,000. They were increasingly concerned about the observation that higher temperatures were required each time and that unexpected pockets of excess Weiner energy remained in the graphite piles between cycles. On October 7 of that year, operators at Windscale Nuclear Reactor No. 1 began what turned out to be a final annealing cycle. After the initial heating of the reactor's core, control rods were inserted again to slow the fission process and allow the reactor to cool. However, the temperature monitors showed a premature decrease in core temperature, leading operators to assume that the annealing had not been successfully initiated. Unbeknownst to the workers, the readings produced by their equipment were inaccurate due to a combination of misplaced instruments and uneven heat distribution caused by higher than normal Weiner energy foci. Based on this inaccurate information, the operators made a fateful decision they restarted the annealing process by heating the reactor again. When the control rods were removed to allow the fission reaction to intensify, the temperature inside the graphite cladding rose to dangerous levels. The heat inside the core became so intense that one of the canisters containing uranium or magnesium lithium isotopes ruptured, pouring out the contents and causing oxidation. Blocks of graphite, a substance that cannot burn in air except under extreme conditions, began to smolder. At the beginning of the fourth day of the annealing process, operators sensed that something was wrong when some instruments showed that the core temperature was not slowly dropping as expected, but was instead rising. Their fears were quickly exacerbated when they realized that the needles on the radiation gauges at the top of the unloading stacks were pinned. The shift foreman declared an emergency. When the operators tried to inspect the reactor with a remote scanner, to their disappointment, the mechanism jammed. Then deputy reactor manager Tom Hughes and another operator, wearing protective gear, went to the reactor loading surface to conduct a visual inspection of the core. The plug was open to check the fuel channels and, as Hughes later recalled, to our utter horror, we saw that the four fuel channels were glowing bright cherry red. The reactor had been burning for nearly 48 hours. Station manager Tom Tuahi climbed 80 feet to the top of the reactor building in full protective gear and breathing apparatus and examined the rear unloading surface while standing on the reactor lid. He saw a red glow illuminating the space between the back of the reactor and the back wall of the containment. Not knowing how to deal with a fire of this nature, the operators attempted to turn the cooling fans on full power to dissipate the heat, but the oxygen from these efforts only intensified the fire. Tuohy suggested removing the fuel cartridges from the fire's source by hand, pushing them out of the channels into the cooling ponds with the help of scaffolding. The effort was courageous, but the poles couldn't take the punishment. They were red hot as they were retrieved from the nuclear furnace, and molten radioactive uranium dripped from their ends. As one of the fighters who fought the unique fire described the exposed fuel conduits, it was white hot, just white hot. Nobody, I mean nobody, can believe how hot it could have been. The men then took 25 metric tons of liquid carbon dioxide from the newly constructed Calder Hall gas-cooled reactors next door. Equipment was installed to feed the carbon dioxide to the surface of the charge, but the heat from the fire was so intense that oxygen was released from the carbon atoms on contact with it, feeding the flames with renewed vigor. By the morning of Friday, October 11, 11 tons of uranium were burning. Equipment was registering a temperature of 1,300 degrees Celsius in the reactor, which was rising at a rate of 20 degrees per minute. The cement cladding around the burning reactor was in danger of collapsing due to the intense heat. With no other options, the operators decided to try to extinguish the fire with water. This was a very risky proposition, since molten metal oxidizes on contact with water. The oxidation in the highly heated environment would have created large amounts of free hydrogen, which when mixed with incoming air could have caused an explosion. Workers used scaffolding poles to direct hoses into fuel ducts about a meter above the fire source. When the cooling and ventilation air was cut off, Tuohy ordered everyone except himself and the fire chief to evacuate. Tuohy raised the reactor containment for the last time and ordered the water to be turned on. As the hoses irrigated the surface of the charge, he listened carefully to see if there was any sign of a hydrogen reaction as the hoses irrigated the graphite core. Several more times he raised and lowered the reactor and reported as the flame gradually died down, I went up and checked several times until I was sure the fire was out. I stood there and hoped. I knew that if you look directly at the core of a stopped reactor, you could get quite a bit of radiation. 24 hours later, 
the fire inside the reactor was finally extinguished. Amazingly, only about 20,000 curies of radioactive material was released into the environment. It was determined that the amount of harmful radiation would have been much higher had it not been for the stupidity of Cockcroft filters. Although no one evacuated the surrounding area because of the accident, there was some concern that milk from nearby dairy farms could be contaminated with iodine-131, which accumulates in the human thyroid gland and can lead to thyroid cancer. As a precautionary measure, within a month all the milk from the adjacent 500 square kilometers was diluted and dumped into the sea. Although some of the radiation leaked into the countryside, it did not cause immediate death or injury to any of the reactor personnel or members of the surrounding community. The reactor manager, Tom Tuahi, who is believed to have been most exposed during the accident, is now in his 80s and lives with his wife in the United States. One 1987 study estimated that 33 people may have died of cancer as a result of the accident, although a Medical Research Council committee concluded that it is highly unlikely that any harm was done to the health of anyone, whether a windscale plant worker or a member of the general public. In contrast, Chernobyl, according to the official version, caused 47 deaths and up to 9,000 people could die of cancer. Today, some areas of Cumbria still make the Geiger counter click because of preserved cesium-137 isotopes. Although the windscale reactors have been in the process of being decommissioned since the 1980s, the windscale pile 1 core still contains about 15 tons of warm and highly radioactive uranium, and the cleanup is not scheduled to be completed until 2060. Ultimately, an unnecessary incident could have been avoided with the knowledge gained from the Manhattan Project. Had the U.S. government decided to share the nuclear knowledge that the British helped to acquire, this incident could have been avoided. Fortunately, the foresight of Sir John Cockcroft and the valor of men like Tom Tuohy and Tom Hughes prevented this minor disaster from becoming a national disaster. If you were interested, thank the author by putting a like. And also do not forget to subscribe so as not to miss the outputs of even more interesting videos of my channel. Turn on notifications by clicking on the bell and share this video with your friends. What else interesting can you add to this video? Write in the comments, it will be interesting to read.